Welcome to Reinventing You. I'm your host, Danielle Silverman. I believe that in today's world of ever constant evolution, the only career change that matters is when what you do matches who you are and what you believe. This show is where you'll learn how embracing change and reinventing yourself will help you navigate any disruptions and lead a life of happiness and fulfillment, especially in this ever-changing world. Your purpose and your meaning will drive your personal transformation. As I like to say, it's your vision, your life. Be passionate about it. Reinventing You starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reinventing You, the podcast where we talk about all things career-related. I'm your host, Danielle Silverman. And today we're going to talk about how to cultivate a leadership presence. I came across a quote recently from Arlene Rankin, who's an esteemed professor of psychology. She said, the way in which we think of ourselves has everything to do with how our world sees us and how we see ourselves successfully acknowledged by the world. I believe that a lot of what happens to us, in particular to women in the corporate world, revolves around that kind of thinking. So to dive deeper into this issue today, I've invited a very special guest, Elizabeth Bachman. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Danielle. I'm thrilled to be on your podcast. And I'm thrilled to have you here. So for everybody, Elizabeth is an executive coach and a presentation skills trainer. Yes, there is such a thing. <laughs> uh, and Elizabeth is the go-to person for advanced level training in speaking, presentation skills, and leadership. Elizabeth has spent a lifetime perfecting the art of presenting, and she helps high-level clients show up as a leader who should be followed, who should be promoted, who should be hired, and getting the recognition that they deserve. What I find most Elizabeth about you, Elizabeth, is that you spent over 30 years as an opera director, working with such luminaries as Luciano Pavarotti and Placido Domingo in more than 50 operas around the world. Elizabeth is fluent in five languages, and you bring your global experience and wealth of tools to help business professionals become respected presenters. You help them rise to valued positions within their company. So I'm thrilled to have you here, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, well, after that quote that I just read, what comes to mind when you hear that? Well, it actually, so many things come to mind, but one of the things that really struck me about it is how we are seen and acknowledged has a great deal to do with how we feel about ourselves. Everybody says you're great or everybody says you're terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you can't help doing that. And even if you know on the inside that you're not what they say you are, it's still going to affect you. On the other hand, one of the things that I see a lot um, often with women and with scientists, uh, I work with a lot of tech people and scientists, uh, I see people who don't think they're so great or who have been conditioned, socialized to say, well, I, you know, good girls don't brag. I don't know if your mother said that, Danielle. My mother did. Yeah. Other things, but <laughs> yes, yes, a few other I'm things. The same. <laughs> yeah, but but basically everybody else thinks you're great. And you say, yes, but I'm not that special. And learning how to accept your own strengths and what the things, what are the things that you do better than anybody else that sound, they're easy for you. So you discount them. Mm -hmm. Learning how to recognize that and recognize that that is a strength and then figuring out how to talk about it is a very large part of the work that I do. Mm. You know, it, it's interesting because it, it does happen a lot, I think, to women in particular. We mm -hmm. see, and, and you're right, scientists as well and tech people who are not necessarily used to speaking in public. They're in their little bubble, right? Well, the people who are who are really happiest uh, sitting at their computer. Yes. And then they have to be out there talking to when they have to talk to other people 
or talk in a meeting don't show up with all the brilliance that they actually have. And the interesting thing is that the more you rise in the leadership, the more opportunity, the more, the more, the more it becomes necessary. Yes. That speaking, right? Well, you have, you have to be able to speak. It's everything from how do you show up in a meeting Mm -hmm. to, uh, to whether you're speaking in public or speaking to clients, or maybe you're at an upper level and you have to talk to the board, you have to do a presentation to the board. One thing about hierarchies, I was talking to a client the other day and you know who had some very young, uh, some employees who were right out of college who don't understand the value of hierarchy. And you know, hierarchies can be a not so great thing, but they're they're actually useful. It's useful to have a hierarchy so that <laughs> you know who's supposed to talk to whom and who do you report to, and that the people at the upper levels depend on the lower levels to to t- talk accurately about what they've done. And one of the things that I find in in employees, is that we know what we've done, but if we don't tell anybody, uh, no one's going to recognize. You think you think the manager is, of course, going to know that you did all this work to uh, to fix the onboarding process, for instance. The manager's not necessarily going to notice that, so you have to actually you have to be able to talk about it to recognize that what it is that this is an achievement, and talk about it. Without bragging, I call it walking the tightrope. You have to walk the tightrope between um, respected and obnoxious. <laughs> okay, without becoming too obnoxious. Now, obviously, there yeah. is there is a correlation, a very, very deep connection between having those presentation skills and leadership. Mm-hmm. So given your vast experience in this area, can you tell us a little bit about this connection and why it's so important? Well, basically, it, it's how do you show up? Mm. Leadership involves um, having a vision and then convincing people to go with you and telling them why it matters and what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we've all had managers who weren't, who were, say, managers, but not leaders, who uh, who didn't give clear instructions. So if you don't know how to be clear about what to do, or um, I could talk more later about uh, hinting rather than asking, but where you don't get clear instructions and so you you don't work efficiently and you don't get the work done because you don't know what it is they actually want you to do and they may not know. How you present that in terms of just plain in terms of clear instructions or what's expected as a leader, and how do you show up as someone who has ideas and and is willing to bring the team along with them? Uh, all of that is part of a leader. Uh, executive presence often means something else. So, um, and that's something that I learned working with the opera companies and working with the opera singers is, how do you walk into a room in a way that people notice you? How do you look confident of uh, teaching a young singer how to walk out on stage and do a good audition when inside they're terrified? Mm-hmm. You know, we've all been there. You know, how sure. do you how do you do that? And executive presence is partly how you show up. And partly how you have trained the people around you to think about you. Mm. One of the things that I've I've learned, um, I've learned too late for me running an opera company of the, the glass ceilings that I hit on my way up. But I learned that you can change the way you're perceived by changing the way you communicate, shifting really shifting the way you communicate Mm -hmm. to where people then start turning to you as the the subject matter expert, the person who's going to know. Right. So communication has everything to do with how you're perceived. It's all communication. So yeah, go ahead. 
no, no, I just said it's all okay. communication. All communication. So I'm curious to know how you got to this point where you have such a, such a deep knowledge of speaking, presentation skills, leadership. What brought you to, to this, to doing this today, to helping well, men, you know, people in I management. like to think that I've been devoted to the art of great communication since I first walked on stage at the age of five. Wow. And I was five years old. And afterwards, I heard my mother say that I was the best damn bunny rabbit ever <laughs> to grace the stage of the hillside school. And I was hooked. <laughs> I thought, whoa, they like that. <laughs> I went from... So I was going to be a famous actress on Broadway. And I went from acting to directing. Turns out I was a better director than I was an actor. And uh, to directing opera singers. And that's where I found my artistic home. And I did that for 30 years, including the last 11 of those years, running an opera company in the Austrian Alps. Oh, wow. And, and so you yeah. switched from that to now doing what specifically well i have i had thought about i i thought like a producer like a business person running the opera company that really um sure i learned a lot of ways not to be a boss so you know sometimes the bad boss was me <laughs> and uh, um unfortunately i'm so sorry i'm so sorry maria um but uh <laughs> we muddled through yeah and um I was also training speakers for the last five years or so of that. And what I discovered was that with the opera, uh, I was beginning, it, you know, I was working a lot with young singers and with young voices, it's the same 20 arias over and over and over again for 30 years. And so I thought it was becoming work. It was becoming, I was in serious danger of losing the ability to be moved by the music. And so I thought I better stop now, get out while I can. And meanwhile, I was training speakers and that was, wasn't was the same art, it was different. I learned something from every speaker. What I've discovered now is that I've put it all together in the work that I do, especially the visible and valued program, where I help people show up as the person who should be promoted and learn how to ask for a promotion to show up as somebody valuable. So visible and valued. That's um, the name of your program. That's, that's the name of my program. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Now we work on, on the, Two separate spectrums of the spectra, I should say, of the uh, of the career world, if you will. I work with mm -hmm. people who are interested in moving on to another industry mm -hmm. or another organization, etc. And you help people stay where they walk they are because they love what they do, but they often find that there there's something that's going on that's not quite right. So what is it exactly that you you help these people with? How what, how do you talk to them? What is it that what they... I really do is help people who who do good work and um and are good at what they do and they aren't they aren't listened to. They're ignored. They're mm. um there's a wonderful uh there's a wonderful woman named Alison Aubrey who talks about um like communication between men and women and she draws the parallel of as a society, we are geared to celebrate the firefighters. You know, the firemen are gonna come and, and put out the fire, but nobody talks about the people who actually installed the sprinkler systems and <laughs> made sure, you know, and made sure that the, the stove wasn't burning. So yay, you've got the firemen who rescued everybody, but meanwhile, the house has burned down, the family's homeless, maybe somebody died, or you've got the nice quiet person who did everything right so there wasn't a problem. And one of the techniques that I talk about, I don't know anybody else who talks about this one, is how do you show the value of things not going wrong? Mm. And that involves recognizing what you're good at mm -hmm. and then 
And then working with a partner, uh, say a coach like me or an accountability buddy, so that someone who's not going to let you say, yeah, well, I did that. That was easy to say, wait, 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 no, that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. So it's, how do you talk about, it's basically, how do you tell strategic stories, talking about what you do and what you have done in 60 seconds, 90 seconds, Mm -hmm. but you can drop seeds Mm -hmm. of what you're good at. And when people hear it enough, then that's how that shifts the perception. It's the same thing as, as say, a product placement in a movie. You know, if you think about how many movies you are where if they're on a computer, they're on uh they're on a Mac mm-hmm. or they're on a on an Apple uh because Apple has sponsored them right. with the subliminal message that if you're on a computer, you should be using an Apple computer. Right. There's actually a lot of money behind that. In this sort of case, we seed our value with stories and we are the product. And because we are our own product, our skills and such, that's where it really helps to work with somebody else because nobody can really be objective about what they're good at. You've got to have outside eyes who can say, okay, that's interesting, not terribly interesting. But this other thing, the one that you just glossed over, Mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah, that's exactly what I do when I help people through the interview process, because mm-hmm. it's also all about stories. And very often people will say, oh, yeah, but it was just my job. Yeah, but gee, it's more than that, right? Mm-hmm. A yeah. lot more than that. Yeah. You hinted at something uh, a little while ago. You you said, you know, when do you ask for something as opposed to hinting at something? Can you talk a little bit more about that? And, you know, what what does it mean? And why do people do it? Why do women do it in particular? Well, this one seems to be a gendered uh, quality. There, there are a lot of qualities about the communication between single focus thinkers and multi-focus thinkers, which could be yeah. men or women. Hinting rather than asking is because somewhere our foremothers with all good intentions tell us, don't ask, don't be greedy, don't ask for what you need. If you if they know you need it, they'll give it to you, hopefully. And so they drop a hint. And that can that can really get people in trouble. And it's so much a part of a way we are taught to speak that most people don't recognize when they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me when when we drop hints like that, and I have to say I've been guilty of it myself, I it I almost feel as if I'm being manipulative a little bit. Mm, really? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's like, you know, just come straight out and ask, you know, and the answer will be either yes or no, or maybe something in between. Well, and maybe it's because we're afraid of somebody saying no. Very possibly. Very possibly. So, Elizabeth, why is it a problem to hint rather than ask? The thing is that hinting, the other person may not actually know that you've asked something. So, uh, and and yet, as girls, we are often taught that not to be greedy. And so you sort of drop a hint and then you hope somebody will pick it up. And the thing is that if the other person doesn't pick it up, then people get angry. uh, So for instance, my client, Maria, this was some years ago, Maria was um, fairly high up in a software company in Silicon Valley, and she wanted a promotion. And she wrote a fabulous proposal for her boss, Jason, about what she would do in the new position. This was her, her vision for the department in the new position. And then she sent him this proposal that she'd slaved over, but she didn't ask, actually say, I'd like to talk to you about a promotion. She just put in the subject line, here's something that will interest you. So that's a hint in writing. And Jason, of course, you know, Jason gets 50 emails an hour. So he saw it go by and he said, okay, I'll get back to that. And then of course he didn't. And Maria waited and waited and waited. 
And a, a week later, she said, what did you think of my proposal? And Jason said, what, what, what proposal? And Maria, because she was trained to never say anything directly, said, oh, it's not a problem. You know, I'll, I'll send it to you again. But inside, she was furious because she was convinced he hated her. This is another gendered thing between single focus thinkers and multi-focus thinkers. Multi-focus thinkers often take things personally. You'll take a no personally and think that because somebody said no, they mean they don't like you. The, the technical term for that is relational thinkers. So if you're somebody who thinks in terms of your relation, your relation to the people around you in a, in a web, then indeed a no is a no to you personally. Jason wasn't saying no to her. He just missed it. She said, it's no problem. And so he said, oh, okay, no problem. And immediately forgot about it. And Maria was furious. She was convinced that he hated her. She talked to her friends, other women who said, you're right. He hates you. How dare he do that to you? And she was ready to quit. And uh, fortunately, one of the friends knew me and said, talk to Elizabeth first. And I talked to her and she said, he hates me. He's never going to give me this promotion. And I said, did you actually ask for the promotion? And, oh, no, you know, he knew he knew I wanted the promotion, but no, she hadn't actually asked. So she resubmitted the proposal after having said, I'd like to get this promotion. I think I would be great as the director in charge of this department. And um, and they made an appointment to talk. It went very well. Jason was thrilled. He thought it was wonderful. And she got the job and has since ri risen very high in that company where she's very visible and very valued. Mm -hmm. And the thing that breaks my heart is she was ready to quit over a misunderstanding in language. And that gets to the heart of what I do. Uh, having lived and worked internationally since I was 17 years old, I, I'm used to working with people in multiple languages where maybe we're all speaking our second or third language. Mm -hmm. I pay a lot of attention to how things are said or how you can be understood in an international situation. And nowadays we're in a very international business world. So how can you make yourself clear and understood if you're speaking your second or third language or it's the second or third language for your, uh, for your audience? And that's culturally as well as the world, words you use. So how, how does this uh, help people in leadership positions, how does it help them with their presentation skills? Well, one of the things I learned from the opera singers is to have good diction, you know, pronounce it right. Ooh. And so for leaders, if you're presenting to an audience, a multinational audience, be clear, be specific, stop at the end of sections, give people a chance to hear what you have to say. If it's something really important, say it twice. The Absolutely. other thing to notice is that in conversation, be aware of what the norms are in the, uh, in the situation you're going to be in. So I ran an opera company in Austria. We were in the state of Tyrol uh, between Innsbruck and Munich mm -hmm. and that's fairly, it's fairly informal, but I was still very careful about whether I used the do for the informal, for you informal or Z you formal. In Vienna, it's a lot more formal and you're always going to say Z. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, German speakers who come to work in America, they often get pushback from the American teams who think that they're rude and dictatorial because in America, North America, please and thank you are so woven into our language that you say please all the time. You know, a, a couple times, yeah, every couple minutes or so, you're gonna say please, or you're going to say thank you. When it's not there, 
people interpret that as you being rude. And yet German, the German language doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So when I was, uh, my opera company was a bilingual opera company for Americans and English speakers and German speakers, mostly with helping young singers get a chance to, to work on it. And one of the first things I did, the beginning of every rehearsal period was to say, Americans, be aware that the German language doesn't use please and thank you as much as American does. So it's just the way the language works. And my German speaking friends, they often think that the, the North Americans are wimps. Say, <laughs> why do you have to use all these extra helper words? Just say, do it. You don't need anything more than that. But the North Americans consider that an order and then they resent it. It's knowing things like that that can help you at how you present yourself. That's all how you all presentation skills, all how you present yourself. It's interesting because in a in a in a global world, uh, that comes that happens a lot, and we learn about that everywhere. I mean, every type of of cross cultural communication. Mm -hmm has some sort of, not just the ones you, you've uh, explained, but sometimes just the the body language also is different. Uh, we talk a lot about that between the Japanese and the Americans. Yes. Well, yes. Uh, and some Africans as well. I remember going to a, um, a, uh, a course uh, in uh, Bethel, uh, New Hampshire, where one of the, um, uh, one of the participants was from uh, Nigeria, I believe. And as he was standing and talking, he was standing, looking down, and he had his arms crossed. And all of the Americans in, in the room thought that was very rude because crossing your arms means you're you're blocking yourself off. Blocking yourself off. And luckily, they allowed him. They you know they they weren't mean or anything, so he, mm -hmm. he was able to explain that where he came from, that was a sign of respect. Mm -hmm. So right. it, it's it's pervasive through all of the communications that we have. Mm -hmm. And we're constantly going to be, to come across people from different cultures, different countries, different languages. Mm -hmm. I think the heart of what I do is the, the miscommunication between single focus and multi-focus. It is another language. And what I find is uh, the simple the the stereotype is men speak one language, women speak another language. Yeah. Men are single focused, women are multi focused. Now we know this is not that it's not really an either or. I know plenty of women who are single focused. Uh, you have to be to rise in an organization these days because Western business was built by men on single focus principles. So you can be single focus on that. The multi-focused people, as I said earlier, are the relational ones. They're the ones that are going to notice the side issues, such as uh, before we put all this time and money into building that new app, are you aware that our competitors already have it on the market? <laughs> you know, might yes. not be as cute as the one or as pretty as the one that you want to make, but there's one that's out there. We're not going to be able to sell it. That actually happened to a client of mine. Uh, she, Ingrid, was fired from the project because this new app was the baby. It was you know, the beloved idea of the senior vice president. And so um, he removed her from the project and some another team built it. And she was over in the corner saying, no, 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 stop. No one's going to buy it. And sure enough, nobody bought it. So it was thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours down the drain. That's, and that's actually a cultural reference. <laughs> useless, I won't necessarily say down the drain, to uh, because nobody wanted to notice because of tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Single focus is great because that's how you get things done. But the downside of that is tunnel vision. Multifocused is great. The downside of that is if you're a multifocused per person talking to a single focused person, you might give lots and lots of detail and context, which the single focused person doesn't care. They just need to know, is this a problem I need to solve? 
and I think of it as the as two different languages using the same words. It's as if the single focus people spoke Spanish and the multifocus people spoke Italian. And if you're going to speak Italian to a Spaniard, you're, you know, they'll understand the gist of what you have to say because the languages are very similar. But for anything important, you're going to want to hire a translator. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's the first time that I, I mean, I've, I've known about this difference, but I've never heard it called single focused or multi focused. So I think that's very interesting and very interesting to recognize it in yourself. So <clears throat> that just leads me to ask, how much is a self-awareness important in this whole conversation? Everything. <laughs> that's the basis of everything. Yeah. First of all, you have to know what your triggers are, how you think, but then put yourself, get out of your point of view and put yourself in the shoes of the others. I have a technique I call strategic empathy, mm. where it's a rule number one for any presentation, whether it's a conversation in a meeting or, uh, or a speech to a lot of people. Rule number one is make it about them, what they care about, put yourself in their shoes and, uh, and then address that they may not they and basically they don't care how you got to your idea they want to know why it matters mm -hmm. and uh, that actually has to do with executive presence as well is if you are nervous when you're giving a presentation um this is the same sort of stage fright i helped singers through and i have been there walking out giving a speech and yes. noticing somebody important in the front row and my mind goes <laughs> you know <laughs> there too, so I don't. yeah we we have all been there everybody does that yeah the thing about the nerves the voices in your head is most of the time they're saying well, it, they're going to say, oh, they're going to think you're stupid. They're, they're going to think they're going to think you don't know what you're talking about. They're going to think you're, you know, you're going to forget everything and you're going to look stupid to them. It's all about what you what your voices think they're going to think. But the truth is, you can't know what they think. You can't be in their heads. They might be there because they're interested. The fact is, if they showed up at all, they're interested in what you have to say. So make it about them. Why do they, why should they care? Why do they need this information? And then it's as if your information is a gift. I like to think of it as here's an image for everybody who's listening. Yeah. Imagine that you are giving a dinner party. You've got a dinner party for people that you really love and you've made a fabulous dinner and you're going to welcome them into your space and they are your guests and your information is the dinner. And then your best information, or if you have an ask, a request, hire me or, um, or buy my product or whatever it is going to be, that's dessert. So imagine walking out of the kitchen into the dining room with carrying a fabulous cake that you've baked and the look in their eyes as they go, Ooh, wow. You are the gift. Your knowledge is the gift. So if you can get out of your own head and focus on them and what they need, that usually takes care of the nerves. I love the analogy. I mean, who wouldn't want a beautiful dessert? Right, right. Absolutely. Yes, that's a beautiful analogy. Um, Elizabeth, we're going to take another break and move on to uh, other things. So we went from talking about... Uh, cross-cultural miscommunication, if you will, to um, working on one's nerves by thinking about 
the gift that you're giving other people. What are some of the, the biggest language confusions that you see within organizations since we were talking about languages? The one that I find most is really the uh, women think that men don't listen to them and men think that women don't get to the point. And again, that's a that's a stereotype. It comes from centuries of uh, of patterns, and we know that those stereotypes are breaking down now. We recognize there's a lot of there's a whole spectrum. That's why I like to think of it as single focus thinkers and multi focus thinkers. Yeah. What the single focus thinkers need to know is how important it is for the multi focus thinkers to be acknowledged. And to recognize that multi-focus thinkers, and this is the one that I see happens over and over and over again, is multi-focus thinkers can hold lots of ideas in their head at once. Mm -hmm. And they may come back to something two hours later, but they'll remember it. The single focus perfect thinker thinks on one thing at a time which is good that gets things done. But the multi-focus thinker will then come into the person who's focused and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about the, you know, about this project. And um, the single focus person says, yeah, 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 sure. Basically interrupted. They don't like, they don't like to be interrupted. It's easier to be focused. The multi-focus person thinks they've been heard the single focus person has, of course, forgotten, and the multi focus person gets angry. As what that's what happened to Maria yes. with Jason. That yes. story. The key is to go to the single focus person and say, "I need half an hour of your time to discuss this project. When would be a good time?" So make an appointment. Yeah, don't do it on the run in the middle of a hallway when. Exactly. Yeah. Make an appointment. And then the gift of that is that when you have that appointment, then they'll be single focused on you. So mm -hmm. you'll have their complete focus. Then don't waste their time. Come in and tell them what they need to know and why. You can have your details and context as a backup. But start out, think bullet points. That's why, this is why we use bullet points now. It's a way to, to keep the information, let people take the information in, in a way that they understand. The Very other, and the other thing for the multi-focus person is make the appointment and then shut up. <laughs> Don't keep talking because the tendency is to keep on talking. And that just annoys the other person. Make the appointment and then wait. It's the first few times to do that. That's really hard. So, so I've been there. <laughs> the the multi the single focus person when that happens has to be able to say, "I'm sorry, I can't think about that right now. Let's let's make an appointment. Could we talk about it at four o'clock, for instance?" It, if the single focus person can acknowledge them, say, yes, I heard you, and I can't deal with it now because I'm focused on something else, let's find a time to do it, the multi-focus person is heard, acknowledged, which is very important to the whole taking things personally part. Mm -hmm. So which people do you seem to, to, work, work, to work more with? Or are they... You know, are, is your client uh, base mostly multi-focused people or single-focused? I imagine they both I, have communication issues. Both, both, but more multi-focused than single-focused because single-focused people, you have to be single-focused to rise in an organization. So um, at least if you are situationally single-focused, the problem when people aren't being heard is when it's a multi-focused person, most often it's a multi-focused person trying to talk to a single-focused person who doesn't hear them or who doesn't understand why this matters because the multi-focused person is giving the whole context. 
as long as the single focus person knows that context is everything, details mm -hmm. are everything, mm -hmm. they can, you know, you can bear with it a little bit. But it's just like speaking Spanish to a Spaniard instead of speaking Italian. Tell them, tell them something, what they need to know, why they care, why it matters, and uh, so that they, and what they're supposed to do about it. I was going to say they, they often need a solution. Yes. What do you want to do? And the other thing, this seems to be a gendered thing, is that men are socialized, boys, as boys, to solve problems. Mm -hmm. This is a problem I'm supposed to solve. So you does the multifocus person should tell them if this is, you know, they recognize they're going to be thinking about solutions. So then you say, this is something I'm going to need action on. I have to give you two pieces of background before we get there, but this is going to be thinking about this in terms of action, or this is an update on a program you've we're following. You don't need to do anything right now. And now let me tell you what's happening. It basically allows the single focus to relax, to know what they're listening for, because they are they hold one idea at a time in their heads. Now, what about women's tendencies to not want to um, toot their own horn, for you know, lack yeah. of a better term? Yeah, because very often, in addition to being multifocused. I find that women are sometimes shy about the, their qualities and, and their achievements. And This is good girls don't brag. Uh, and, and so here's a historical perspective for you. Uh, I like to think in historical pers perspective so that I don't watch the evening news and think it's all happening for the first time and, and, and despair. Um, yeah. We've had centuries of men controlling the money, men controlling the power, protecting women, because women were the ones who have babies. Women had to stay home with the babies. And until effective birth control came along, women really were mostly stuck at home, doing on taking care of the childcare and the family, Men were not taught to take care of that part. Men's job was to protect the women. Now, since the 1970s, women are taking an equal place in business because daily life does not revolve around strength. It does not revolve around warfare, mostly. It revolves around how do you think? And that's where you have both people. The key is you need both. But because of these centuries of tradition, it's passed down. I don't think anybody does it on purpose. I think it, you sort of learn it through society that girls are not supposed to ask. They're not supposed to be greedy. They're not supposed to be forthright. In a way, uh, girls are supposed to talk like the Japanese where something is implied rather than stated. Uh, and, and so the, the boys are taught to get to the point. So boys won't understand it if the girls aren't getting to the point. And this whole thing about not talking about how good you are is girls are also punished for bragging. So you have to walk a fine line between talking about what you're good at, then you acknowledge the team, but don't leave yourself out. And so much of history has trained us to just be helpful and be quiet in the background. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that if you are helpful in an organization, if you're the helpful person who solves problems, and stays in the background, somebody else is gonna take it, step into that vacuum and claim the credit for the work that you've done. We've all lived through that. Absolutely. And, and so how, how is it possible to show our achievements without bragging? Well, I have a program yeah. I called Seeding Your Value with Stories. You drop seeds and 
basically what you want to do is what you want to do is keep track of your uh, of your goals whatever your goals are every week you may have a in your company you set out your goals once a week and at the end of the week you talk about what you've done often it's an email it's a one paragraph email the key is track it on a document do it in a document first and then once a month Go through your goals and see what you did, see what worked, see what what worked, what didn't, what are you proud of, and write a story about it. So yeah, I can I can say I've lived and worked internationally since I was 17 years old. And that has given me the gift of listening for the way people speak and noticing when people are being understood or not, and also learning to speak with an awareness that the other person might not might not be following me because of the language barrier. Hmm. So I could talk about that, which is a gift that I got from the years of the opera company. Now I use that to help others. It's not exactly bragging, but it's talking about something I'm good at. Huh. Is it only women who uh, encounter this sort of thing, or is are there mostly some... women? No, most... most women and the introverts. Okay. The experts. There, there's something also called the expert trap, which is another piece of this, okay. which is talking about how you got here because you're so excited about what you do that you give more detail than you need to. That's not necessarily oh, it was nothing, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. That was, and this is so cool because da, 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 and your listener is completely lost. Uh, so the same, it is actually the same pattern for different reasons. Again, cool. but it come back to why should they care? Mm. Uh, you don't want to do too much how and not enough why. That's very interesting. Wow. What other... Um things do you see come up most in the work that you do? It's a combination of learning how to talk so people can hear you and recognizing your value. And there again, uh, the Visible and Valued program is a group mastermind mm -hmm. for exactly that reason, is that uh, women... Women or girls are trained to collaborate, whereas boys are trained to compete. That's another stereotype, but it's it's a lot of a lot of it. So little girls are trained to work in a group, and your relation to the group is very important. So if you have a group of peers who are saying, "Yes, go for it, do this," you can. Um, then it's easier to move forward because you know you have the support of the group. You don't have to be all alone. And you shouldn't have to do it all alone. Well, no, in today's world uh, of complexity and, and uncertainty, uh, we talk. We don't really talk about competition very much. We talk about co-opetition. So cooperating with your competition, which is another kind of skill. Uh, what strikes me is, I, I'd love to know your your sense of whether or not the kinds of things you're talking about are actually changing within organizations today. They are. There are many, many organizations where this is this, where people skills are emphasized mm -hmm. and how important it is. And since the since the pandemic, since people were got used to working from home, we're still working out as a society what the world of work looks like. We're still, you know, it's going to be a few years before we settle into a norm again. Yes, it's working. Yes, it makes a difference. And one of the things that that has been proven statistically is that companies with diverse leadership, so up at, being a leader is very important, diverse voices in leadership have better profits. Ah. They have a better return on investment. They have less employee turnover because if you've got people leaving in droves, it's expensive 
to find new employees. It's a employee turnover and, and churn is expensive. Yes. So you have a better return on your investment. And when I first started talking about this, they were talking about getting women on boards and the statistics were that companies with diverse leadership had 19% better, um, better ROI. Three years later, it's 33% better mm -hmm. ROI. So there is a difference and mm -hmm. it is making a difference. Things are changing. It makes total sense. I mean, you hear about group work when everybody has the same background and they know the same things. There is nothing much that gets done. Yeah. It advances fast. So it, it just makes total sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I know you have a podcast as well. And you share your insights on that po podcast, uh, in those podcasts. Is there something that stands out for you, a favorite episode or something that resonates with our topic today that you'd like to share? Well, you asked me about um, leadership presence and I have an episode. It's actually a series of uh, three or four shorter pieces about what is executive presence and how do I get some? Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so we, how can they, how can people? And um, you can find that on uh, you could find it on my website which is elizabethbachman.com slash podcast oh, cool. and hopefully you'll put it in the show notes for this podcast which yes. will be the quickest way for sure um elizabeth one final question what sort of advice would you give uh people today who really want to move into leadership positions i would say um get a partner get allies, recruit some allies and helps learn how to know what you're good at, how to talk about it. And what do the people who make the decisions care about? And can you, can you solve their problem? Mm. But don't try to do it alone. Do it with somebody, especially somebody who's trained like you and I are, mm. so that you can, you have outside eyes to help you. Very important. Yeah. As the saying goes, you can't see the label when you're inside the bottle. That's a very good one. I've never heard it before. Excellent way to end. And I also want to point out your your slogan when you want to make a difference, not just a point. I think that's that really resonates. It resonates with me and hopefully it resonates with a lot of our listeners. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for coming today and sharing your expertise with us. Thank um, you, Danielle. It was, a, it was an honor to be on your podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Reinventing You with me, your host, Danielle Silverman. Tune in on the second and fourth Monday each month at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Join me and feel inspired and optimistic about your future. We only get one life. So embrace change and thrive with me. Find work that aligns best with your soul and what you enjoy. For more information, go to reinventingyou.com.